from the Congress Health. We'll talk about some um, answers and tricks on um, data change. Right, hi. Uh, I've got sort of three different things to talk to you about today. Let's see how we go for time, and uh, I don't want to cut into everyone's beer drinking time too much. <laughs> I know how important it is. Uh, so, uh, sort of, I've got two sort of short stories to tell you, sort of try and base what I'm going to talk around um, about uh, some of the stuff that we sort of do. Uh, uh, it's not real, I've put it all on a laptop here, um, so normally I use big enterprise systems with millions of records in order to make a reasonable presentation today. If you have me, it's a lot smaller than it normally be. Uh, I too, like these guys, uh, don't purport to be an expert. Uh, these are sort of things I've learned as I've gone along. Uh, some of them may be useful, you may disagree with some, that's great. Um, uh, you may think I've got something completely wrong. Feel free to, uh, to let me know if that's the case. Uh, but certainly, you know, I've done a little bit of thinking about some of this, and that's where I've sort of got to. So I'm going to switch backwards and forwards because I'm going to try and make it a little bit practical. Uh, so we'll see how we go. So the first, um, so the first story is just about some geospatial data. Uh, so this, what you're looking at here, is sort of the, the lower part of the central North Island. Um, the orange coloured area is the Mid Central District Health Board. So I work for Compass Health, we work in healthcare, uh, particularly primary healthcare. So that's most of the data that I'm interested in is to do with health. Uh, and what you're looking at are little, little black dots on the screen are basically every single patient domicile, where every single patient uh, that's funded uh, through the District Health Board through the PHO is uh, And then in behind it, the orange area. Uh, is effectively the, um, the DHB, but uh, if I get rid of actually the patients uh, in this view, and it just takes a second to calculate. If we get rid of the patients, what you'll see <coughs> is the, uh, the orange section is, is coloured progressively from the centre based around Palmerston North. Um, like I said, work with technology. Uh, from Palmerston North, which is very light, into much darker further out. And these are what we call isochromes. So basically, uh, it's a trim time calculation I've done geospatially. So we've taken all the road network and done a whole lot of uh, complex geospatial calculations and worked out uh, how, what the travel time boundaries are. So what we're interested in is how far people live, live away, in this case from Palmerston North Hospital, and how that affects or impacts their travel time. Uh, and quantum GIS, piece of open source software, it's great, but obviously when we're doing presentations, no, it doesn't want to do what it's meant to do. There we go, click in the right place. Okay, so we've taken the layer off of all the patients. So that's what the isochrones look like. And what I want to do, so uh, what I want to do is take some of this data that I've used geospatially and put it into R. And for today, I'm going to do some really basic calculations on it, but there's all sorts of things we can do with geospatial data. Uh, I know you can do geospatial calculations in R as well, uh, but I'm, I'm a firm believer in we should use the right tools for the right, uh, you know, for the right job. And we've got all these fantastic open source tools. Uh, so why not use the, the tools that are designed specifically for this specific task? So R is really good for statistical computing. Uh, uh, Quantum GIS, I think, is very good for visual uh, visualisation of geospatial data. And I use um, some other tools to do the actual geospatial processing. So in terms of uh, how I structure all the data, is what I'm really trying to talk about, is this is a, uh, a basic whiteboard uh, diagram of all the different interactions I've got just in, uh, in this project that we're, we're doing. So in the middle there, because it's an R talk, I've put R Studio, uh, and we've got a couple of databases we connect to. So most of our data in our enterprise is not stored in text files or CSV files. We store it in proper relational databases, uh, and most of it's actually a Microsoft SQL Server database. Um, but I don't use that for most of the geospatial work that I do. Uh, I know Microsoft uh, SQL Server now does geospatial work, but uh, I use an open source product called PostgreSQL. Uh, PostgreSQL is a very good, powerful um, cross-platform database. Uh, it'll run on Linux, it'll run on Windows, it runs on uh, you know, Mac uh, as well. Uh, it also has a whole lot of plugins, just like R. One of those plugins give it a lot of really powerful geospatial capability. Uh, so most of my geospatial processing I do in PostgreSQL. So you can see I move data out of SQL Server into PostgreS, and I move data out of SQL into R, and I move data from PostgreS into R as well. I do a whole lot of stuff out there inside. So I'm going to talk to you about how I have to sort of achieve some of that. Make sense so far? Okay. So who uses uh, projects in RStudio? Well, not many people. Oh, okay, thought it'd be more than that. Uh, I love projects. Projects are great. Um, so if you, if you don't know about uh, projects in RStudio, go and have a bit of a play. Uh, it's just a, I find a very easy way to get everything in one place. Uh, it sets up the environment for you every time. Uh, it's just a really quick and quick, easy way to have a look at all sorts of stuff. Um, the other thing I want to talk to you about, one of the tips and tricks, is uh, I like to keep 
create a common structure. It may be a bit small, but uh, you'll see over the fold structure on the right in this project, um, I have common folders. And I call the folders uh, the same thing across all my projects. And so I have a folder called R script, and that's where I put all my R scripts. And I have a folder called SQL, and that's where I put all my SQL files that I connect to the database with. I have a folder called cache, and we'll talk about cache in a second. It's where I cache objects out of R that I don't want to do expensive uh, calculations against. I have a folder called output, so anything that I'm outputting out of R goes into the output folder. So I try and keep it in an orderly fashion. Uh, it has an advantage when I'm running scripts, things are always in, the, in a place that I know about. Uh, but also if I want to use other products like uh, Quantum GIS or uh, LaTeX to go and find uh, output, it's always in a, a known place effectively. And uh, setting it up in our studio uh, with projects, projects uh, also help you organise that file structure because it just brings it straight up and shows you um, all those files. So anyway, you'll see uh, here, hopefully, um, I've got a whole lot of scripts. Uh, and I, I guess it's, um, my talk's the anti-talk of what um, James is talking about, because James is talking about um, you know, a, a large uh, R&W file or a, a number of files that get brought together. Um, my background is software development originally, uh, with a little bit of information analysis. Um, and what we're taught as software developers is to keep things small, keep them usable, uh, keep them manageable. Uh, so most of my uh, the projects I work in are on uh, have lots and lots of files, and they're very discrete chunks of files. And I'll show you in a second how I manage to keep them all uh, sitting in, in together in the right place. But what you can see here is I usually start with a, a file in every project called INI, INIT for initialization R, and that's where I do all my startup stuff. So pretty much every project I use has that. Uh, and then I have a whole lot of other scripts that I want to do different things with. So if we go and have a look at this, I'm just going to set a few options. So this is just looking at uh, my initialization file. Uh, so we'll talk about connecting to databases in a second or RADC. So I just do a whole lot of things in my initialization file. So I um, define a connection string that I'm going to use to connect to the database. Uh, I've got a whole lot of common functions that I want to use there to just help the functions for this particular project. Uh, and we scroll down and see just a whole lot of functions, just a whole lot of stuff that we don't really need to go into um, today. So I've talked about that. Uh, I believe in keeping um, scripts small, but have lots of them. Uh, RStudio supports that as well. You've got the tabbed environment in RStudio. Uh, so I hate continually scrolling through you know, uh, scripts lots. I like to have lots of little scripts so I can jump between them with my little tabs in, in RStudio. It also means when I build the scripts, I can build it, I can test it. And when I'm happy that this, that particular short script is doing what it wants, <coughs> it can close it and go away and never have to worry about it again. Uh, it makes it a lot easier to test and uh, uh, build. Particularly when you're sort of building stuff up slowly, you can just do it in, in chunks and not have to worry about um, accidentally editing the wrong thing. So uh, it leads on to, if you've got lots of small scripts, the problem is how do you know where to start? So I have always called a file called IMIR, um, or what order the script should be running is the other problem you might have. If you've got 100 script files, how do they work together? What has to be run in terms of uh, where? So there's a way of dealing with that, and I'm sure there's probably a package out there, um, you know, hundreds of packages for R that, that actually helps you deal with this. I have my own little help function that does that, and it's called dependency tracking. And what I can do at the start of every single R script I have, uh, I just have a statement that talks about what that, that particular little script uh, relies on to have run before it. And if that hasn't run, it'll go and run that. So I end up with what, what's called a dependency chain. And it means that my R code documents what it relies on. So it's sort of like a require statement with packages, but it's actually a, my own personal require statement for my scripts and my projects. And it goes and runs them when I need, when I need things done. And I'll show you what that looks like. So if we uh, go and look at, so load basic isochrone data. So again, you'll see my, my script names try to be descriptive. So I'm saying, you can probably guess what this um, script is going to do. So it's the idea is it loads uh, so the isochrone data from the database and it puts it into a data frame. So you'll see at the top we've got a command called dpnr uh, and it says INIT. So that's saying that script needs the initialization script to have run uh, before it can run this. So what will happen is if I go and 
uh, run that. What you'll see in there, well, it's great when you can hear in a live demo. That's hilarious. So what you'll see here is, uh, that, at least that worked. Um, detected required dependency INIT, and so what it's done is it says, okay, the script, before the script runs, it needs the INIT file to have run, so it then goes and runs that. And that seems really simple, but as we go into more complex scripts, we can have three or four dependencies and they can chain each other. So uh, what I'm talking about there is uh, this scenario. So I've just numbered the different processes. So imagine we had seven files in our R project. Uh, and script number one uh, was the sort of the, the first script that did everything. Script number two did something else, but it needed script number one to run. Script number three needs script number two to run. Script number four needs script number three. But then you go into the, the later on scripts. Script number five only needs script number one to run, six needs four, seven needs three. So we've got a dependency chain. So all I need to do by using that dependency, it doesn't matter if I've got 100 files, if I just need to know, need to know something out of script seven, so it might be um, average number of patients in each isochrome, uh, I can go to script seven, run that script by itself, and because I've documented all the dependencies, uh, it'll go down and it'll run script three, script three needs two, script two needs one, so then it'll run script one, two, three, and then seven for me. So it's all inside the, uh, inside the script itself. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is pretty cool. So what it means is, uh, I'm not sure why that didn't run, which is worrying me. Live demos, they're always a the nightmare. Let's try to run that manually. So, uh, Jaden, when, you, when you've got a long chain, uh, does it need to, like, this may be what you're about to talk about, does it need to run everything, or have you got something set up that says, hey, you've already run? Yeah, so it only, uh, it only runs it once. So, um, if you've run seven, which is run three, two, one, and then you run five, it doesn't run one again. Yeah, so it's trying to be efficient with resources. So you, yeah, you, yeah, try not to run things a hundred different times. Uh, right, we'll just see if restarting our studio is going to help life any. So it runs them if they are saved as in the format they are saved on the disk. Sorry, say that again. They run the module in the form they are saved on the disk. No, no. So or, these so active object. No, so, oh sorry, yeah, they run as they are saved on the disk. So if you make a change to a script and don't save it, uh, it will run the what's on file, so that's a gotcha. Um, like I said, I mean, one day I might get around to actually putting this into a proper package and deal with a lot of that. Um, again, this is just a problem that's, you know, this is just something I've built to solve a, a problem that I had. Um, okay, so that seems to have run properly now, which is good. So basically the idea is, uh, so that's the loading script. If I just want to go and plot the uh, isochrone areas, for example, You'll see here we've got a dependency. It says uh, it just depends on load basic isochrone data. And load basic isochrone data is dependent on the INI. So all I need to actually do is go into here, run that, it will load the packages, it will then run all the previous scripts, uh, all its dependencies, and then you'll see I get my graph over there. So the idea is I just need to go to the script that I want the output for, I want to run. I don't need to remember everything uh, that's, you know, that's in that chain. This is a very, very basic. Um, Basic example. So, uh, this is a more complex one, it's more of a chain, so it should load some more. You'll see it's detected a couple of dependencies there, uh, then loaded a few things, and saved this out file into the output directory. So what you'll see here that we've done now, oh, that's actually one step too far, sorry. So what we've done is with that script, what it's done is it's gone away and it's loaded uh, one data set for the isochrome, it's loaded a whole other data set, a data frame for the, um, the patient data, and then it's put them all into a, a plot and put it into a grid and saved it out to a, a PDF uh, and a JPEG. And what I'm trying to achieve uh, by doing this is just a, a, a basically a demonstration is once we're in once we're in quantum, uh, what we can do is we can build up a, a graph. So I want to show it, because it's not showing very well on this small screen, unfortunately. But effectively what we've got here is, uh, is the map with some uh, isochrone information on it. And then I've taken R, it's pulled the data out of the database, created the plot, and then from quantum GIS, uh, pulled in that known location, that output location, the, um, the plot, and put it onto the um, composer here. Once it's there, uh, so I can run that script, I can update it, I can update these graphs, and once it's there, I can export it, 
and we get the final product, uh, which looks like the one I just showed you. We get a PDF with the R output sitting in there that's come from the file, the isoframe data that's come from the database, um, and the chart data that's also come from the um, database itself. So the other thing I wanted to show is in terms of loading data. So communicating with the database is I use a package called RODC. So um, ODBC is, stands for Open Database Connectivity. Um, I think it's a really good way to connect to databases. There are a number of ways you can do it in R. Um, ODBC is a really common interface. Most uh, modern uh, databases have an ODBC driver with them. It's in completely independent of R itself. Um, you, you can also get uh, ODBC drivers for Excel and Access and all sorts of uh, other things. So you can also read, write to the database, uh, or write to Excel files. Uh, and it means that you've got a common package that you can become really uh, adept with, rather than use lots of different packages to specifically connect, connect to different database um, platforms. Um, so what uh, our ODBC needs is a, um, uh, is a way to connect to the database. So, Again, what I would suggest is, I, I set it, the way I set it up is <coughs> I give uh, RODBC a connection string. And there's lots of different ways you can set up an ODBC connection string. And what most people will be, will be familiar with is doing it through Windows by going to the ODBC um, data sources. Who's done this before? Yeah. yeah. Okay, bad way to do it, I reckon. Um, so you can go into here, you can set up a system DSN or a user DSN, so data source name. Um, uh, and then what you do is you go in and you put the data source name as the connection string. So it's, it's easy, it works. You've got a nice graphical interface to use. But what I'd recommend is if you are going to get into using ODBC to connect to databases, don't use, uh, don't use data source names. Use what we call a DSN-less connection. And that's where we actually specify a bit more detail in here. Um, so you'll see here, I say what driver I want to use, what's the server called, what's the database called, and the username and the password to log in. The reason I think this is a better way to do it is uh, it makes the script more portable. So if I've got my machine set up and I set up my, my, data, my connection to my database and I call it um, Jaden's connection, and I give it to my colleague sitting next door to me and she goes to run the script, she's got to have the exactly the same name of the DSM on her machine for it to understand and run. So she has to set that up independently. If I do it like this, all the details for how it needs to connect to the database is stored inside the R script. Now, it does depend that that person's got the driver installed, um, but that's relatively minor. They're going to have to have the driver installed even if they set up a, a DSM connection. So, uh, if you are connecting to databases, a good tip I'd give you to make your code more portable, uh, I would certainly use a DSM list connection. Who's heard of those before? Anyone? Plus, plus the problem of getting through the firewall and proxies, so that's another story. Uh, yeah, well, usually I work inside an enterprise, so, um, and I work for ICT. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I used to run ICT, so most people do what I tell them. Um, uh, okay, so that's uh, DSMless connections. So we've just gone a little bit out of order, but it's okay. Ah, okay, that's the other thing I was going to talk about. So uh, we talked about my common structure. Uh, and so we've got that R scripts folder and we've got that Cation SQL folder. So I have that SQL folder. And when we are using RODBC, what we have to do is we provide uh, the SQL SQL logic, structured query language to a database to tell it how to pull the data back. So we can do that one of two ways. Uh, and the really easy way to do it is you embed the SQL statement in your R script. Um, the problem with that is it gets really messy really quickly and you get really big long R scripts, which I hate. So I, I hate big long R scripts. So another trick uh, that I use is I have that SQL folder, and I write all my, uh, my SQL statements actually as separate SQL files. So inside my SQL folder here, you'll see I've got three files, one called isoprones, one called isoprones with patients, and one called sample. Um, now I can open, uh, I can actually open these inside um, R, and you'll see, you know, R does an okay job of remaining sort of uh, um, but one of the advantages of not uh, having, uh, having these in separate files is I can actually open these in a proper editor. So I talked before about using the right tool for the right job. R is not an SQL editor. Uh, so if I put them in separate files, I can have my SQL editor open, I can be writing my SQL, have it saved to a file in my SQL directory, and I can be using R to do my R stuff and just pointing at it file to load it. Uh, so you'll see here I've got syntax highlighting, I've got all my comments, you can see my comments. Um, this is not a trivial SQL statement, for, uh, by the way. So this has got a whole lot of geospatial queries in it. Um, it's got queries within queries. And this is sort of some of the complexity we get into when we're doing some of this work. So you don't want this embedded in your R file. It's got nothing to do with R. It's got nothing to do with the stats or processing the data. It's pure data extraction. 
So the way I refer to that in my, uh, my code is I have a little help function. It's only a very short um, call anyway, but I have a help function. You can find it. So load basic data. So you'll see here, um, uh, get data frame from ODBC isochrones. So my help function, um, my help function does two things. It actually returns a data frame, connects to the database, and pulls it back, and it takes that parameter isochrones, which it knows is a, is a uh, the name of a file, an SQL file. So that help function actually goes to my SQL folder, and it looks for isochrones.sql, and it loads it into this variable isochrones. So inside this isochrones variable here, I've actually got the SQL statement. Hmm. Actually run. Oh no, of course it's not. No, oh, sorry, that's the uh, data frame. I'm um, going to go to. So here it is. Um, so I uh, then have another help function get text. So you see it's going to the SQL statement uh, in the file path, and it's not providing any separators. We just want to read it in as normal. And my get text is just doing a rechar call, which is in the base package of R, um, and provide the path and the length of the file. Uh, and this function just returns the data frame. So instead of having, so what I'm trying to get at here is instead of having a really big messy chunk of SQL and a really big messy chunk of uh, code to call an RODBC connection, I've just used a few help function, functions, condensed it down to one line. Because I've got a known structure, they can all be in one place. I can use an SQL file to test it, write it, and then go, you know, have R for concentrating on R code. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about was. Uh, maybe, maybe this is the last thing. Uh, it's caching. So I have this folder called uh, cache. And most of you probably know, particularly if you use RStudio, you can like, save the whole workspace in, in RStudio. Sometimes that's okay. Um, I actually don't like doing that very much. Um, you can save all your mess everywhere. I like to start fresh sometimes. But what I also don't like doing is some of my queries I run, even on uh, large enterprise systems that we have, can take uh, 10 minutes, an hour, two hours, even some of them five hours. Um, you know, we're dealing with millions and millions of records of data sometimes. When I'm writing, particularly when I'm writing the scripts, I don't want to have to run that query every time I go to run the script. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to run the queries once, and once I know that that, that looks, looks okay, I just want to cache that data. So the expensive um, pull to the database and all that calculating by the database can just be saved out to a relatively inexpensive disk space, um, and I can then use that. But at any later date, if I want to refresh it, I can go back and just rerun it against the, um, the data set itself. And to do that, that's what I call caching. Uh, so I have a cache folder, and that just makes it easy for me to know what data, what objects I have cached. So, um, for example, in my script here, uh, this is a relatively expensive operation. Um, so here I'm, I'm pulling out uh, how many patients live within each of those isochrones. Uh, so I've got to do a whole lot of geospatial calculation and then understand for every, every one of about those 500,000 patients whether they fit within that um, geometric area. Um, so what I have is I just check to see um, uh, so I, I just store the path in a variable to begin with, so cache isochrones patient R data. If the file exists, then I just load that. I don't, don't bother going to the actual database and getting it. I know that data is not going to change very much. I don't have to do that expensive database operation all the time. If it doesn't exist, then I actually do the um, get the data frame from the ODBC, which takes, I think, about 10 minutes in this case. Uh, and then once I've done that, the next step is I do then save it out to that cache. Um, so if I want to refresh it, it's just as simple as I can just go in and delete that file out of the cache, and the next time that script runs, it'll know while that file's not there, I'll actually go and get it from the database. If it runs again, it goes, oh, it's in the cache, I'll get it from the cache. And loading it off the disk only takes about two seconds or something. So uh, really good when you're writing scripts if you use that idea of caching the objects. Um, it's, especially if you're writing scripts and you've got a whole lot of mess and you want to clear your workspace out, uh, but you don't want to have to redo those really expensive operations all the time. So, given that it's uh, here at Falk, I'll keep going back to the start of my presentation. Um, I think we'll probably uh, finish it here. Is it, uh, I guess, oh, well, maybe I'll just mention uh, RADBC, um, there's some problems between 32-bit versus 62-bit, 64-bit. Uh, 64 bit. Um, so, for example, uh, the um, I have Office 32-bit installed on this machine. That means I've got to run in the R, the R and 32-bit environment, but my PostgreSQL driver is 64-bit. Um, so I can't have the same script that does the same operation. So what I do as a cunning thing here is I use a cache. So 
So I start up our studio, I run the database operation, it caches the data to the location, I close our studio, reset to, to run in the 32-bit environment, start it up, and then I can run the operation that operates on the Excel. It's a little bit laborious, and it'd actually be better if we got all the right software together, but there are some issues with that, um, RADBC and, and some of that interoperability around the different uh, platforms. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for your time. Hopefully we'll learn something. Um, any questions? Yeah, um, have, you, have you ever heard of Make? Oh, yes, 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 yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, a lot of the stuff could be done with news maps or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same, I mean, it's, a, it's the idea of a, um, uh, so Make, Make's a compiler, right? It's the idea of a, um, a things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's the idea. So, we use, I come from the Microsoft world in terms of development, so, um, yeah, a compiler understands the dependencies, it brings in what's needed, and then what's good. So, yeah, there's a tool there that does it already. Mine's are very, very simple. Simple tool. Just yeah. have um, maybe rather stupid question. Uh, so, say for example, if you have dpend r yeah. running that's your function, so uh -huh. you say dpend r i and i t, so that's your initialization script. And yep. You make some mistakes in the initialization script, but you, you run other latest model script which depends on it. Yep. Now, obviously, that doesn't work. It will say error or something. Yeah. Now, r is really notorious about. <laughs> really knows. Really. So, yeah. yeah. So if you do a trace back yeah. on that error, yeah. you, would they tell you which line of initialization code that's making an error on, or will they just stop at the depend R command? I'm just curious mm -hmm. on that. Um, it won't stop at depend R. It'll keep running. Yes. Yeah. So that's how I have my environment set. Um, yeah, but would it? The, I guess the point. The, I, I think the point is because you've got very small bits of code. You, you can run them and test them and then put them away and not touch them. So once they're running, generally they're not going to break, unless it's a connection to the database or something. And that's usually pretty obvious. So I tend, the reason I do it the way I do it is I tend to run into those types of problems a lot less because I've got much smaller uh, chunks that I have to worry about. So it's the idea of write it, test it, and then leave it alone. It's sort of like a thing to yeah. test it to yeah, so I, I, I can't answer your question specifically, but I certainly know I have fewer problems like that now. I use much smaller, much smaller scripts, script scripts. Would that be fair? Do you find that? I, well, everything you said, I agree entirely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from using that. <laughs> if you want to give somebody else your project or hand it over, do you just send a zip file with the uh, Ten folders and all sub files there. Yeah, it's called Zip. Zip. Or whatever compression program you want. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we use, I guess the other thing to comment on is that the beauty of using smaller files is we use source control as well. Uh, so that, that helps you change the, it control the changes in your files. If you've got one massive file, um, source control is less useful. Uh, so I know there's a lot of integration with um, GitHub and, and RStudio. Uh, we don't use that, we we use uh, a proprietary product, but yeah, the idea of using much smaller files helps there. Um, so so using these files, the small files, has got far more advantages than just having to zip stuff up and send it through to someone. The point is though, we very seldom send it through because we're all using source control. If I want the person next to me to do something, they actually pull it down from source control. We all work locally, but it's on a, a stored, known version of and copy, so I check back in the next person next to me can check out. So we don't so actually have, have to email. So you have version control on the small files as well? Yes, yeah. on everything, version control on everything. And we don't share the files, the source control shares the files out. So it's only if I'm sending, sending something externally, I need to zip it up. But again, zip will, will, will keep all the file structure. Um, the problem that I'll have is, of course, uh, drivers, database names, um, my custom functions like depend, the, the dependent function some of that. So most of the work I do is not designed to send to other people. Uh, if we're going to do that, we'll strip a whole lot of stuff out and send them something similar if we're trying to illustrate something. Okay, thank you very much. Well, um, not really, because it is 3 o'clock. <laughs> but uh, 
what I'd just like to say is that, uh, uh, that the reason for these meetings is to foster a community in, the, in R in the open source language. So please feel free to stand up and, and, and give a presentation on, on whatever you want. Now, uh, next time I'll, I'll, I'll put my hand up to start to, uh, uh, give you a quick talk about a, um, uh, um, a piece of analysis I, I've been doing around uh, shopping basket analysis and extending that into, into, into a spatial uh, uh, dimension. But uh, if you guys have, have anything which you want to talk about, feel free, we want to hear you. And also, if you, if you feel keen to stand up and give some tips and tricks about what is it you learn, what, uh, how do you use R in your environment, we want to hear that too. So, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, drop us an email or post yeah. yeah, post feedback on Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's fine. We'll try our best to arrange it. Yeah. yeah. Where's yeah. our next meetup? <laughs> <laughs> Tricky question. <laughs> We're thinking maybe February, February, February yeah. end of February, yeah, end March, something like that. So, uh, uh, put your thinking caps on, have a, good, uh, have a good think over the break, what you want to talk about, and uh, yeah, uh, come and stand up and, and give us a presentation. So on that note, I'd, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, um, uh, MVP Thanks, Amy. Yes, yeah. but also also Harmonic Analytics. They the, the, they've put on all the all, all the food and drink. They've also uh, uh, funded the um, um, the uh, uh, Meetup uh, 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 website. So uh, a big thank you for them, and uh, thank you to our speakers, James Stanley and Tech uh, Ika Ikeda Ikeda from the. Uh, the the University of Otago, and Jane McRae from, from Compass Health. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> now we're off to the pub. Um, yes. The Royal. Join us if you can. Where's the Royal? The Royal is on uh, Lambton Key. It's the old, it's the old um, uh, Paris pub, or the Dog and Dog. Smile for the camera tech. Big smile. Big smile. There we go. You're a star. Yeah.